tradition, it was in a highly ceremonial and religious uh, context. It's no wonder early explorers saw the Marquesans as savages. They had almost no written language, no history, and by that time, they were isolated, barely traveling at all. But Dr. Rowlett is finding clues that the Marquesans' ancestors were more sophisticated, more civilized than anyone imagined. We're going to uh, cross the uh, river uh, here. Centuries of thick jungle growth hide the secrets of that civilization. Joseph, on va débrouiller un peu. Vaitahu was one of the most densely inhabited valleys in the past. There's evidence of an intricate society with a complex social order of priests and chiefs. So here we have the residence of one of the uh, chiefs. This is the uh, retaining wall of the uh, chief's uh, platform. Look at the size of the boulders in the base of the wall. I'm six foot. This wall must be a good uh, eight feet uh, tall. It's one of those cases where size really does matter because the size of the stone and the size of the walls was a reflection of the status of the person living here. The most powerful chiefs command the construction of massive stone platforms known as pai pai, foundations for housing and public ceremonies, all part of an elaborate, well-ordered communal structure. For a young man growing up here, the first rite of passage comes in the form of an intricate tattoo. The evidence shows that tools made of fish and human bone or shark's teeth were used to force ink into the skin. Pigment for the tattoo is made from ash of a cooked tree nut. Until death, the story of his every battle will be tattooed into his flesh. For this young man, a remarkable journey is beginning. Deep in the Marquesan jungle, Rowlett makes a surprising discovery. This is it, this is it. Oh, here are the petroglyphs. Here in French Polynesia, is a startling echo from Easter Island. Petroglyphs and large tikis, like the great statues there. This is one of the a few uh, petroglyph sites that we know of in the, in the uh, valley. Tikis and petroglyphs are images that represented deified ancestors. The head was the most uh, sacred part of the, of the body. So what you see here is just the representation of the eyes of the tiki. These petroglyphs are really interesting because they're so similar to the ones that we find on Easter Island. Other than Easter Island, the Marquesas are one of the only few places on Earth where you'll find this kind of giant tiki. It's an intriguing link. The first hint of a Polynesian homeland. But the hunt for proof is just the beginning. Battle of the Pacific sponsors History Defined on National Geographic Channel. On an isolated string of islands in the Pacific, Dr. Barry Rowlett and his team are trying to find evidence to support a controversial theory. We're going to bring all the uh, squares down to 75. For centuries, scientists believed that ancient Polynesians were too primitive to navigate the vast Pacific and colonize other islands. Earlier scientists and archaeologists believed that it was very difficult to travel across the ocean, and so that once Polynesians reached islands such as the Marquesas, people were isolated with no further voyaging. The Polynesians were seen as accidental settlers blown by chance across the waters, marooned on their islands. But Rowlett believes they were much more sophisticated. 
We're going to call this layer C because it's starting to get uh, darker there, we can see already. That they intentionally made long round trip journeys for trade and colonization. We're looking for archaeological evidence of inter island voyaging and exchange. It's a fascinating theory, but he needs physical evidence to prove it. Let's see what you got. What do you think about this? This is unusual. Mm. It's, like, it's a marine uh, animal. So far, he hasn't found anything definitive. Only certain artifacts are useful as a window into the past, and Rowlett doesn't have what he needs. Until... Jackpot. Jackpot? Yeah. Uh, what do you have? Fish hook. Oh, beautiful. Wow, jackpot. This is a pearl shell fish hook. Try to clean it off. It's unusual that we find an unbroken fish hook like this in the excavation. So I'm just recording the location of that fish hook we found. The fish hook is made of pearl shell, and that's their first major clue. It's quite rare because it grows best in lagoons, and there are no lagoons in the Marquesas. This fish hook must have come from somewhere else. But the closest island with lagoons harboring this kind of pearl shell is over 1,000 kilometers away in the Tuamotu island chain. How could shells from that far away have made it here? We think it's quite possible that the larger pieces of pearl shell that we find here in the site actually are coming from the Tuamotus and may have been exchanged between archipelagos. It's a good start, but he can't prove the inter-island trade. And with the ancient vessels long gone, evidence is hard to come by. Because the wooden canoes that the Polynesians used are not preserved in the archaeological record, then we have to look for other evidence if we want to study inter-island exchange and voyaging. As the dig continues, another find takes them one step closer. A kind of ancient blade, a cutting tool known as an adze. It was the most important tool in ancient Polynesia. We're especially interested in the stone adzes. This is an incredible one. Adzes were the basic uh, woodworking tools for, for Polynesians. It's unusual to find one that is so large. This weighs at least 10 pounds. Rowlett has been finding something unexpected about these adzes. We found that in the uh, deepest deposits of this site, more than half of the adzes are made of stone that was brought to Tahawata. The stone used to make these tools does not exist on this island. Like the fish hook, it must have come from somewhere else. And in this case, they have an idea where. If they can prove it, it'll be solid evidence of long distance trade voyages. Rowlett has enlisted volcanologist Dr. John Sinton to join his search. Our goal was to try to find the actual quarry where the rocks were being produced. Others before them have attempted to locate the quarry, but failed. Rowlett and Sinton charter a helicopter for the distant island of Eau. Remote, uninhabited, Eau is hundreds of kilometers from Rowlett's dig site. But they believe the stone found here might be a match for their adzes. On a bright morning, the helicopter pilot drops them off on the distant island. We jumped out of the helicopter. He took off and told us he would be back in five days. Rowlett and Sinton head deep into the wild, tangled forest of Eo. They have food and water for just five days. Eo is known as an island of ill fortune, inhabited by the spirits of the ancient people. After four days of hunting, they've got nothing, and they're exhausted. Searching, running up and down the, the ridges, across the, the plateau, searching everywhere for the quarry. No drinking water, no water to wash with. We were absolutely dirty and stinking by that time. For three days, they'd had no luck at all. The day before we were supposed to be picked up by the uh, helicopter, we were bushwhacking across a small ravine, and that's where we found the workshops for chipping the adzes. This may be the breakthrough they've been looking for. 
the stone source for the ancient tools. When we started to dig through the piles of flake, we realized there was nothing but, but stone debitage. From hundreds of years of, of chipping away to manufacture these adzes. They look like the right kind of stone fragments, but they have to prove it's a match. Rowlett and Sinton take samples back to the lab to test their theory. This rock comes from the island of Eau in the Marquesas. We recognize this rock as what archaeologists call core, that is the primary source rock from which adzes could be fabricated. Dr. Sinton compares the source rock brought back from Eo with Rowlett's adzes. He needs to heat the rock into a molten form to analyze its chemical composition. Chemical composition is like the fingerprint of the sample. When people find artifacts elsewhere in the world, if they have this identical chemical composition, most likely the sample really did come from AO. The liquefied rock is pressed into glass discs that will allow Sinton to analyze the chemistry. The results of the study are striking. The raw material at the quarry is identical in chemistry to these artifacts that are found all over the island. These two are, in fact, an exact match. It's a solid link between two distant islands. We found the quarry. They had established a major ads manufacturing complex on AL and were exporting the adzes to Tahiti, the two Motus, and Mangadeva. With the same Eo adzes turning up from the Marquesas to Tahiti, is evidence of a regular trade route covering hundreds of thousands of kilometers, much further than anyone imagined. This discovery from Dr. Rowlett and his colleagues is transforming the study of ancient Polynesia. This was a revelation because it started to show that there were voyaging spheres that linked the Marquesas and other islands in central Polynesia, what we refer to now as this East Polynesian homeland. The Adzes are hard evidence of two-way, intentional, long-distance voyaging. This is a radically different idea or, or view of Polynesian societies because instead of looking at them as being isolated, we now see a lot of interaction and communication. Dr. Rowlett's dramatic discoveries suggest prehistoric Polynesian societies were more sophisticated than earlier experts thought. Now, the crucial question is, did they travel all the way to Easter Island? And what truth lies behind the story of Hotu Matua and the lost continent of Hiva. On Easter Island, the elders are positive their forefathers came from an ancient homeland called Hiva. To them, the facts are clear. Hiva is described as a land of green and jagged cliffs, ruled by tattooed warriors and fierce clans. Conflicts erupt, and rival clans go to war. Chief Hotu Matua prepares his men for battle. They are fighting for control of the island, fighting for a homeland. Chief Hotu Matua and his men lose a decisive battle. Defeated, they must flee. Hotu Matua must find a new home for his people. The high priest dreams of a faraway island to the east, in the direction of the rising sun. 
Hotu Matua knows they must leave the island before more of his men are killed. He commands scouts to search for the island in the priest's dream. That's the Easter Islander's story. But could ancient Polynesians from the Marquesas region have traveled so far? Thousands of kilometers across the ocean. Did they even have the right vessels? That's the huge question boat restoration expert Bono Louis is wrestling with. On a conçu cette pirogue là. On a été, on a, on a, été, on a fait des recherches. C'est une pirogue de guerre. Là, il s'est barré à la with few written records of their maritime past, Louis is working from knowledge passed down orally through the centuries to rebuild a traditional wooden canoe. Et le modèle, d'après l'histoire, on dit le shape a été pris sur le coco. Parce qu'elle a un modèle demi-arrondi en dessous et elle a la forme plate. The canoe is made from a special kind of tree found here. Perfect material for long distance travel. Après les, les histoires, l'histoire, les anciens, ils prennent plutôt le bois de... C'est un bois qui est léger et résistant à la mer. Bono Louis grew up here, over 3,000 kilometers from Easter Island. But remarkably, he has heard the very same stories as those islanders. Stories of a defeated tribe that set off on an epic journey. D'après les histoires, l'histoire, avant ici, c'est un clan qui est obligé de, de partir parce qu'il y, y a la mort derrière. Il n'y a pas d'autre possibilité de, de s'enfouir avec une, une pirogue pour partir. Et ça, ça leur donne du courage pour découvrir les îles, les autres îles là on peut habiter. They load up in preparation. The final piece of cargo was sacred stone from Hiva on the voyage to their new homeland. And so Hotu Matua and his people begin an epic journey. A voyage that could take them across thousands of kilometers of open ocean. They will battle stormy weather, rough seas, and blazing hot sun as they venture into the unknown. Hey! Hey! The canoe will be their home for many weeks. But with no land en route, food and fresh water will be scarce. If there is no food, there is no food. And if there is no rain, all they have are a few coconuts and whatever fish they can catch. They fish souvent des requins, comme c'est c'est un poisson qui très dangereux. Danger is all around, and the distant hope of a homeland far off on the horizon. This is the Islander's story. For Bono Louis, one key fact is about to check out. Setting sail, he and his team soon find out that these ancient style canoes really are seaworthy. Bono Louis also knows one more crucial piece of information, that the island he's sailing from goes by the ancient name of Hiva Ua. In fact, According to an ancient map, a 300-year-old document from a Tahitan high priest, many of the islands in this region originally went by the name of Hiva. The name from the Easter Islanders' stories. It's the present-day location of the Marquesas, a remarkable link to the legend. After centuries, could they have found the mythical missing continent?
It's clear that the ancient Polynesians sailed the South Seas. But the Pacific Ocean covers one third of the Earth's surface. Could they really have undertaken long distance journeys, like the amazing voyage to Easter Island? Many historians and scientists assumed that Polynesians crossed the ocean largely by accident, being blown off course. For a long time, the ancient Polynesians were considered too primitive to intentionally voyage to distant locations. But one clue shows that they may well have. It's a kind of ocean map known as a stick chart. Thin pieces of coconut fronds are tied together to represent ocean currents. Small shells attached to the frame show the location of land. It's a chart of islands visited, all part of the evidence that led Barry Rowlett to believe the ancient Polynesians traveled far across the Pacific with a plan to colonize the islands they found. Our new theory is that the discovery and settlement of Polynesia was a systematic and intentional process and not at all accidental. Previously, experts believed this long distance voyage across the Pacific would have been impossible for two main reasons. Firstly, the wind. A trip to Easter Island would have taken them towards the rising sun, from west to east. But across the Pacific, the winds in the tropics blow in the opposite direction, from east to west along the equator. These are the trade winds, and many thought they'd make a trip east impossible. But Rowlett has noticed something in these islands. At certain times of year, these winds actually shift. Today is an unusual day. Normally, the wind comes from the, from the mountains. Today, the wind is blowing from the ocean, from the west. Some of the earlier researchers just looked at the prevailing winds, and they didn't take into account the seasonal changes. These changing winds are called the westerlies. Any ancient sailor would have known about them. The westerly winds then will come and go. Polynesians would wait for them to come in order to sail to some place that would otherwise be difficult to get to. This would allow a canoe, like Hotu Matua's, to sail east with the wind at their backs. But there was still a second major obstacle, navigation. How did they pinpoint land in an immense ocean without a compass or any other tool? Nainoa Thompson and the Polynesian Voyaging Society are working to find answers. I really believe navigation is at the core of who we are as people. Here it comes. They intend to prove their ancestors were able to sail on epic two-way journeys across the Pacific. Open the main. Easy, easy. And that they have the navigation skills to do it. Let's turn up. Come on. Thompson is a master navigator. And then we're going to start to uni the canoe that way. He trained with one of the few people on Earth who knew the secrets of how the ancients once steered by the stars. Micronesian navigator Mao Pialu learned this craft through oral traditions passed down from generation to generation over 3,000 years. Everything you see on this canoe that we do today, fundamentally, it all came from Mao. How did the ancients find their way across the vast Pacific? And in a culture with no writing, how were routes and directions passed on? <laughs> Thompson believes it's through the same ancient art of celestial navigation the Master Mao saved from extinction before he died in the summer of 2010. When Mao passed away, all of a sudden he cannot come back on this deck anymore. Master Mao's death left Nainoa Thompson as one of the last navigators on Earth to pass down this knowledge. So when we come here and start talking about navigation, it's not some trivial academic intellectual exercise. We're setting the course. Now, Nainoa Thompson just needs to prove that this ancient knowledge would have allowed their ancestors to cross thousands of kilometers of open water to find their way to Easter Island. 